Slam and Flag, but I'm not. It's the Tony Topping Show. A very special guest on the programme, which is George, gorgeous George Galloway, who's come on to chat about Syria. I'm interested to ask him a few questions, and I'm very interested on his comments regarding some of the projects he's working on. Without further ado, Mr George Galloway, good evening. Good evening to you. A pleasure to be on with you, Tony. Thank you very much, matey. From the days of talk sport, you were interviewing me about UFOs, and now I'm interviewing you. And, yes. <laughs> and the it's question, a funny old world, as Mrs. Thatcher said. It is, it is a funny old world, isn't it? And, and the question I want to ask you, George, is uh, someone like me who's a member of the public, who, who you know, who's uh, looking at all this, is asking the question, why is there a money for a war? With Syria, but there isn't the money for there isn't the money for basic welfare provisions, jobs, schools, etc. That's right. Well, we've never got money for the public services we need, but we've always got money to go around the world setting fire to other people's countries. We don't have money to keep our old pensioners warm in the winter time, but we can set fire to Iraq and Afghanistan play a role in the setting fire to Palestine and Lebanon. And now uh, we see the British government trying to persuade other governments in the world to do what the British Parliament would not allow them to do, which was join a new war against Syria. And uh, it beggars belief, actually, that a country which is almost bankrupt can have unlimited funds for death and destruction. And at this very moment, this evening, in London, there are protesters blocking the roads in East London to try to stop people going to a weapons fair, an arms bazaar, where Britain is inviting all the grisly dictators from around the world to come and buy weapons off us. And on the front page of the Mail on Sunday today, we saw the most remarkable splash headline that the chemical weapons we say that the government of Syria used a few weeks ago on the outskirts of Damascus were sold to them by British companies with the connivance and with the license given by the very British government that now wants us to go to war. You really couldn't make it up, Tony. You, 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 you couldn't make it. You know, as a member of the public, seeing David Cameron stand up there and talk about the, the, you know, talk about the disturbance he had regarding the killing of innocent children, men and women. Uh, surely, Mr. Cameron George is a great humanitarian. He, he has this strong moral compass to do the right thing within the international community. Am I tech, am I being duped there? Well, he invited us in his speech in Parliament to take a look at the videos. Right. of the suffering and death of 338 Indeed. people, he said, uh, in Iraq. The French say it was 238. The Americans say it was 1,488. Mm. So their mm. intelligence uh, doesn't seem to be able to tally. Uh, but, of course, there are many videos from Syria out there mm. in the public mm. arena mm. on mm. YouTube. One of which I posted on my Facebook page, mm -hmm. George Galloway MP, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. very evening. I warn you, you'd have to have a strong stomach to watch it. But it was yet another of literally thousands of videos put up by Al-Qaeda elements in the civil war in Syria, supported by us, armed by us, financed by us, sawing off a man's head and holding it up to the camera whilst chanting the name of God and other um, uh, religious incantations. It, uh, it beggars belief that this country is being asked to join a war on the side of Al-Qaeda. Yes, the same Al-Qaeda, which uh, 12 years ago, almost to the day, flew airplanes into the Twin Towers, murdered thousands of Americans. We all saw the buildings tumbling down. We saw the people jumping out of the windows. We saw the horror of it all. But now, 12 years later, there are allies. Well, no, thank you. I don't want to be allies of Al-Qaeda, and I don't think the majority of British people do either. Yeah, indeed, George, and you, you talk about the, the... There is. Do you think there is a confusion in mainstream society regarding people who worship peaceful Islam, the peaceful Islamic faith, compared to the people who are in Al-Qaeda? Do you see this ignorance in our society quite often? 
Well, uh, of course, the the person who allegedly, I say allegedly, though we saw him do it, uh, tried to cut off the head of a British young drummer boy uh, in the streets of Woolwich in South London uh, just a few months ago. Uh, if he had done that in Syria, William Hague would have given him money and would have given him the weapons with which to do it. We are encouraging in Syria the very elements we are terrorized by here at home, who blew themselves up, for example, on 7-7-2005, on the London Underground and on a London bus. We are encouraging the demons, the serpents of extremism on the immoral principle that my enemy's enemy is my friend. Well, your enemy's enemy isn't always your friend. Sometimes your enemy's enemy is worse than your enemy. And we didn't learn the lesson of Afghanistan in the 1980s when we brought forth the monster of bin Ladenism, of the Taliban, and the kind of people that we're now fighting uh, in Afghanistan. And some of our young men, hundreds of them, in fact, have come home dead in boxes. And uh, thousands of our young men have been wounded and maimed fighting the very people that we armed, financed, and conjured forth in the first place. So, so really so, what we're saying is William Hague, the Foreign Secretary, is fully aware of what he's doing, is fully aware of the rank hypocrisy uh, the, of uh, this action. Uh, but, but, uh, and how do, you, how do you view that as, a, as an MP within Westminster when you meet these individuals as to your gender at play? How, how do you, why are you doing this? I asked the Prime Minister, you can look it up, no. Uh, on uh, YouTube, I asked the Prime Minister at Prime Minister's question time about five months ago if he would adumbrate for the House the main differences, just the main ones, between the Al-Qaeda we were fighting in Mali and the Al-Qaeda we were supporting in Syria. Answer, he had none. I asked him, these hand-chopping, throat-cutting, head-chopping people that are our allies in Syria are exactly the same people that we are fighting in Mali, as we and the French uh, set out to do, that we are fighting in Afghanistan, the very same kind of people, extremists of the most bloodthirsty, bestial variety, are our allies in Syria and our enemies elsewhere. No one could make sense of such a policy. It is close to a definition of insanity. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I totally yeah. agree with you. And George, uh, what, what intrigues me the most about you is, is you know, I've been an admirer of your work, a very strong, very strong in what you believe in. Uh, can you indulge my imagination for a minute? You are, let us imagine, uh, it's number 10 Downing Street. You are the Prime Minister. You're Prime Minister George Galloway. The press are outside. You've got the serious situation to deal with. You've got the Assad regime to deal with. If you're the Prime Minister... What would you do, Prime Minister Galloway, with this situation? How would you handle it? It's, it's quite simple. We have to stop doing what we're doing right now. Just this week, David Cameron, in this country of ours, which has millions of people unemployed, which has laid off uh, hundreds of thousands of public servants, which is uh, presiding over a more divided society than we have ever had, gave yet another... £57 million pounds to the Syrian rebels. This brings to hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of pounds of British taxpayers' money that has been given to the Syrian rebels in the last two years. So we're going to stop doing what the previous government of David Cameron has been doing. We're going to do instead the following. We're going to support a negotiated settlement, a political solution to the crisis in Syria, the framework of which already exists and was drawn up by the respected former head of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, more than a year and a half ago after he was uh, uh, summarily sacked uh, by Britain and America for having done so. He brought forward a framework called Geneva One. Geneva One was a framework of a negotiated settlement, a political route, to a negotiated settlement, to a transition to democracy in Syria. This was sabotaged by Britain and America, which thought that it could bring down the Assad regime on the battlefield. That has failed. 
and a hundred thousand people are now dead as a result. We are going to refloat Geneva too, under the joint chairmanship of the United States and Russia. And we're going to force the belligerents to sit there until they've reached a solution. And neither side is going to receive another bomb, another bullet, another gun, or another dollar in aid of any kind until they have settled their accounts in Geneva and agreed a way forward for a transition to democracy in Syria. And, and how uh, would you, George, uh, visualise? This, this gives the listeners a very good landscape, this concept I'm coming at you with, I feel. How would you how then, would, George, I'm no, intrigued to know, if the red phone's ringing, the President's on the other end saying, Prime Minister Galloway, our Navy is in the Syrian waters, this, that and the other, what, what would you advise the President? What would you say to him in that scenario? I'd say that such an action would be absolutely illegal, that Britain, their closest ally, so close there was almost a Lewinsky-like closeness over the last uh, decade or more, uh, will come to an end if you commit this crime. And we will seek to prosecute you in the international criminal courts, uh, which you have not signed up to, but which nonetheless will be invited by us to take a judgment on the illegal act that you are proposing to take. It does not have the support of the United Nations. The United Nations is the arbiter of international law, not any one government or two or three governments within the international community. And we're going to support a peace process, a negotiated settlement to this crisis. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, indeed. Excellent. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. You've, you've given your thoughts very clearly there, George, and it makes a lot of sense. You, you think then the consequences of um, hitting Sy uh, Syria's infrastructure with cruise missiles, etc., etc., what do you think, how will the game play alter in that country if America and, let us say, Britain uh, go ahead with that? And the second question, do you think that Cameron, Mr. Cameron, our Prime Minister, is capable of betraying the democratic process and finding some way, some very very little dodgy loopholes so he can get involved in the conflict. Uh, on the latter point, I doubt that. Right. Although the mass media are doing everything that they can right. to push us into that position. Yes. The BBC and Sky are daily and all day mm. uh, dilating on whether or not the vote of the House of Commons can be reversed. Mm -hmm. But it will not be reversed. If Cameron were to bring it back, he would suffer an even more humiliating defeat. Mm. Because the British Parliament, so close to an election, can hear the views of the great majority, 89% in fact, in the last poll in the Daily Telegraph, which I saw, are against it. And the British politicians will not go quietly into that good night. The shadow of Iraq and what happened to Tony Blair is too long and too uh, great for that to happen. Uh, but on the first point... I must tell you that any American attack on Syria will quickly become a regional war. The first consequence will be that Syria and its allies will launch a military assault against Israel. Israel will undoubtedly retaliate. And then we will have a regional war between the Arabs and the Israelis and possibly the Iranians and the Israelis, all, all setting fire to the most combustible place on the earth, where so much of the world's energy resources are deposited. The streets, streets of uh, Hormuz will be on fire. No oil will move out of the Gulf. Go oil and gas fields in the dictatorships in the Persian Gulf uh, are best friends. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, and so on, will all be on fire. There will be a cataclysm which will reverberate around the world, and it will not be confined to that region either, because terrorism will spread across the world like wildfire. So be afraid, be very afraid of what the consequences will be if Barack Obama launches this war in the next few days or weeks. Well, why do you think, Kurt, George, you, you, you strike me as a man of peace. Why do you think there is such an agenda uh, going on? Are you guided by religious faith? And do you think there is a, a battle between good and evil? Or uh, what, what drives you, George, religiously to... Do, do you think there is a battle between good and evil and it's a re religious proportions? No, I, no. I, I don't no. think in such manichaean right. terms. Right. In fact, it 
troubles me greatly that there are tens of millions of people, particularly in the United States, mm. religious mm. fanatics who want to bring about Armageddon, mm. who want mm. this to be the end of times, who believe that Jesus will come back if only we can fight Armageddon. Uh, Armageddon is a town in uh, what is now called Israel, by the way. And they hope that on these holy lands, some kind of cataclysm leading to a rapture and the return of the Messiah can occur. I just think that this kind of thinking is doomed to lead humanity to destruction. I don't believe in good versus evil. There are evil people on all sides. I'm not a supporter of the regime in Syria. I've already told you that I want to see a transition to democracy in Syria, negotiated at Geneva under joint superpower uh, uh, chairmanship. So this is not good versus evil. But I promise you that evil will prevail in that region and around the world if we are plunged into this disaster by a United States president, Barack Obama, who was elected to bring these wars to an end, not to begin new ones. Do you think do you he's think manipulated? Do you think the British Prime Minister and the US President are manipulated by uh, what we would say military industrial complex uh, issues or, or lobbying? Uh, a Raytheon, for example, their shares are going through the roof, George. They're well, doing very well. I wish I wish I could say that I believe that. Right. But I'm afraid the truth is more prosaic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is down to the politicians. Nobody can manipulate President Barack Obama. He doesn't have to face re-election ever again in his life. He's in his second term. He defeated John McCain by a landslide victory, only to hand over to John McCain the conduct of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. It beggars belief, but no one is manipulating him. He's entirely responsible for his own actions. No, this is about protecting Israel, yes. It's about controlling the Middle East and its energy resources, yes. But above all, it's about projecting American power to show any upstart, upcoming members of the BRICS, uh, Russia uh, mm. and China mm. in particular, mm. that America remains top dog mm. and that no competition for that position will be tolerated. And I think that uh, we in Britain and the rest of the world should not pay the price of American hegemony in the world. We yes. need to bring about an end to single superpower rule in the world. We need multipolarity in the world with lots of powerful countries and blocks in the world. We were safer when we had that. We've been unsafe ever since we ceased to have it 20 or more years ago. Mm. Mm -hmm. you, you refer, George, a fascinating remark. You refer to Syria as the last castle of Arab dignity. Could you tell the listeners more about that remark that I read you were quoted as saying? It's the real reason that the Western countries hate the Assad regime in Syria. It's not because it's a dictatorship. We love dictatorship in the Middle East. All of our best friends are dictatorships. As a matter of fact, almost every country in the Middle East is a dictatorship. It's not because it's one family rule. We love one family rule. Al Saud has even called its country after the name of its one family rule. In the government of Kuwait, all 27 members of the government have the same family name, Al Sabah. It's a family business, like all of these friends of ours in the Arab world. So it's not for any of these reasons. It's because the Assad regime maintains a position of belligerence and war against Israel. It refuses to accept that Israel, which has occupied a part of Syria since 1967, imagine, a decade after decade, part of Syria has been illegally occupied by Israel. And Syria and its regime has never accepted it, has never signed a surrender peace deal with Israel in the way that other Arab countries have done. It's because Assad will not sever his relations with either the Palestinian resistance or the Lebanese resistance, Hezbollah, which gave Israel its only ever defeat on the battlefield in an Arab-Israeli conflagration. And because 
perhaps this is the most important one of all, because Assad will not sever his relations with the Islamic Republic of Iran. And to a very large extent, this is a proxy confrontation. They are not yet ready to confront Iran, so they are confronting the next best thing, which is an Arab country sympathetic to Iran. Do you, uh, do you think, George, that the, the end game is Iran then? Do you think they will attack Iran or do you now think that Russia and China have, are now putting the, the, uh, the two-fingered salute up to America? Do you think the conflict could escalate with involvement Russia and China in an engagement between America, Russia and China militarily? Do you think that's what it could escalate to? If it, uh, if it became a war against Iran, definitely. Yeah. I think we would then be in World War Three. And uh, if that's not enough to keep you awake tonight, I, I don't know what would. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. Tell the listeners, George, this interesting story that I noted about you, where you uh, there's a witless article in the Daily Telegraph uh, about you taking money from an Assad-sponsored uh, TV station. The Daily Telegraph failed to mention, however, that the establishment that uh, you are challenging on this issue offered Assad a knighthood. How do you answer your critics to that article? That, that what I've read is that you took money from. A a Syrian-sponsored TV station? Well, well, you can say I took money from a TV station mm. in return for presenting TV programs mm. for them. And they only know that in the Daily Telegraph because I've registered it, as I'm required to do, in the House of Commons mm. Register mm. of Members' Interests. I'm a TV presenter and a radio presenter, and I get money for presenting programs. The TV station in question is the fastest growing television station in the Arab world. al Mayadeen Television has, in one year, built an audience of tens, scores of millions of people across the Arab world because it's telling the truth hmm. about Syria and about other Arab-Arab and Arab-else uh, conflicts and issues. It's an outstanding television station. I'm proud to work for it. And, of course, I get paid for my work. I, I was paid to work for Talk Sport. Mm -hmm. I'm paid to work for Al Maidin Television. And if the BBC want to offer me uh, a TV program, I'll be pleased to be paid by them for doing so too. So you're not bothered so, then, George, about working for the BBC that would be a state broadcaster? Then you wouldn't wouldn't bother you no, about it. No, I wouldn't for this for this reason, and it's the same reason uh, that pertains in Al Maidin Television. Nobody tells me what to say. Nobody no, tells me what to think. Right, I right. say and think what I say and think, yeah, whoever yeah. I'm working for. Yeah, and nobody yeah. at al Maidin has ever asked me to say anything or asked me not to say anything. And if the BBC would make me the same offer, I'd be glad to do a programme for them. Gotcha, gotcha. Interestingly, George, as a member of the public, I just want your thoughts on this. Why do I need to turn to Russia Today or Press TV uh, to see what's going on? Your thoughts on that. As a member of the British public, I have to watch Russia Today and Press TV, which has now been removed by Ofcom, to find out what is really going on in the world. Your thoughts on that issue? Well, you'll be glad to know I'm shortly, with my wife, uh, going to be starting a weekly program on Russia Today. Lovely. Which Lovely. is, uh, I think, the only credible international news station mm -hmm. available mm -hmm. on satellites around the world that we have left. And watching RT... And then watching Sky and BBC is a parallel universe. It is. It looking is. at exactly the same story, exactly the same issues, mm. but from an entirely different standpoint. Mm. And I agree with Russia Today's standpoint. I think they're telling the truth, and the BBC and Sky are lying. Very, very, well, very, true, very true, very true indeed. I, I just find your clarifications of these points fascinating, George. Tell me something for the listeners. I, I describe you as a bit of a grey man because the media um, portray you as being an Assad supporter, which I, I, I think that's not great. I think that you're a man who, who, who perceives the situ situation well. And on that case, we're looking at the... It says here there was an article that you flattered Assad's aides in getting aid over to the Palestinian uh, camps there. I'm fascinated by this story. Can you tell the listeners what that was all about and, 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 and how you managed to do this? I'm fascinated. Well, I flattered the governments of every country that we drove a very large convoy of aid to the Palestinian people in Gaza uh, who were under siege and bombardment by Israel. 
and to move a convoy uh, of uh, many vehicles and many people and a great deal of aid requires you to flatter every government, including our own. I had to flatter the chief constables of the Metropolitan Police in Kent and all the way down to the Channel ports. I had to flatter the French authorities, had to flatter the Italian authorities, had to flatter the Greek authorities, the Turkish authorities, the Syrian authorities, the dictatorship of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. I'm ready to flatter any authority to get aid to people who are dying for the want of it in a besieged territory which has been besieged and occupied for 65 or more years by the criminal state of Israel. It's okay then, George, for, for Israel to drop phosphorus bombs on uh, Palestinian for civilians, but obviously but there's another rule for the international community when it comes to what's going on in Syria. Would I get that correct? Right. You? Yes, and we learn from the Mail on Sunday today, front page splash, that the chemical weapons which uh, we are told Assad has and are told has used, although I don't myself believe that, but has, I have no doubt, were sold to him by British companies. British companies mm -hmm. sold Assad the sarin nerve gas that we're now being asked to bomb Syria for the possession of. Is, is now a cabinet aware of that, do you think? Would be the Prime Minister? Would he be fully aware of this? The government admitted it on the front page of the Mail on Sunday this very day. I don't understand I don't. how a Prime Minister can stand up in front of his own people, George, and say this is wrong to, to gas innocent men, women and children, while at the same time the very administration that he serves is, is, is flogging uh, chemical components to, with weapon, for weapons to Syria. Oh, we've, been here, we've been here before, Tony. Yeah. yeah. The Iraq inquiry, arms to Iraq inquiry, yeah. so expertly dissected in 40 minutes by the late Robin Cook, proved... Uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt that the Thatcher government was supplying weapons, including weapons which were turned into chemical assault on the Kurdish people, for example, by Saddam Hussein. They did fuck all with that, George, didn't they? That Bush he did nothing with the Kurdish people was gassed. The hypocrisy is staggering. In fact, the British and American government, for many months after that crime, when I was demonstrating outside the Iraqi embassy about it, were still maintaining that it was Iran that had carried out this attack mm -hmm. rather than Iraq because we were on the side of Saddam Hussein then because he was against Iran. Now we, we've destroyed the Saddam government with the cost of a million dead Iraqis, three million exiled Iraqis, Iraq broken into a hundred pieces, each one of them governed by a sectarian militia, thousands dying every month, still 11 years, 10 years uh, after the war, getting on for 11 years, uh, that's been a great success, hasn't it? We are guilty as a country and with our main ally, the United States, of sowing murder and mayhem around the world, all the while lecturing the world about morality and justice and law. You really could not make this up. It's insane, it's George, insane. as you have rightly George. said. It's absolutely, it's absolutely insane. insane. And uh, the listeners would probably be interested, if you don't mind telling us, about the about latest project that you're involved in to do with the a Tony Blair documentary. Would you mind telling the listeners about that? Plug it away, kid. <laughs> I, I'd love to, and I'm grateful for the uh, opportunity. Yeah. I'm making yeah. a documentary film called The Killing of Tony Blair. It does not, of course, involve the killing of Tony Blair, but deals with the killing done by Tony Blair and the killing being made by Tony Blair. The killing of the Labour Party as we knew it in the days of new Labour that Blair led. The killing of the million Iraqis I talked about, an uncountable number of Afghans. The killing of Syrians and uh, Lebanese and Palestinians all the while that he was Prime Minister and now, unbelievably, the so-called peace envoy in the Middle East, a peace envoy going around the area, stirring up as many wars as he possibly can, supporting brute dictatorships when they put down their people uh, who ask only for democracy. Mr. Blair has made a killing out of both. He is currently earning almost £25 million per year. There is no corporation, no dictatorship that he will not take money from. And I'm talking serious money, 25 million pounds a year. Mm. And it continues to this very day. Mm. On this day, 
He signed two new contracts with the governments of Vietnam and Peru. He's already a sovereign wealth advisor to various dictatorships around the world, and he is involved in business in the very places that he's supposed to be the Middle East peace envoy in. So the taxpayer is paying him to be the Middle East peace envoy and paying for his entourage and his protection and his many houses around this country and elsewhere, whilst he piles up the money and piles up the clutch of houses uh, that he has. And I think we've got to stop this man. I think we've got to put this man on trial and, if possible, in jail. And this documentary aims to do that. So if you want to follow it, you can go to The Blair Doc on Facebook. Uh, you can follow it on Twitter, at The Blair Doc. Or you can go to kickstarter.com, look for the killing of Tony Blair, and give anything, one pound, five pounds. Five pounds gets your name forever in the credits at the end of the movie. And larger donations get you various other uh, perks in relation to the making of this film. Think Fahrenheit 9-11, the marvelous Michael Moore uh, movie which did for George W. Bush's reputation. What Michael Moore did to George W. Bush, I aim to do to Tony Blair. Right. Uh, okay, George. That's, uh, and that can be on Kickstarter, listeners. If you check that out, it is on Kickstarter. It's uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, George Galloway, uh, MP, thank you very much indeed. Could you just, uh, I, could, I could talk for hours to you, George, but could you tell the listeners, if they're interested, a bit more about your Respect Party, please? Well, the Respect Party came out of the anti-war movement in 2003-04 when we, in our millions, marched against the war and were ignored by the mainstream political parties. I had been a, a Labour member for 36 years. I had been a Labour MP uh, for uh, 17 or 18 years. I was kicked out by Tony Blair from the Labour Party because of my role as one of the leaders of the anti-war movement. We set up respect. I have defeated New Labour in two uh, election campaigns, most recently in Bradford, where I gained 58% of the vote, therefore more than all the other parties put together. I absolutely destroyed a rock-solid Labour majority, and we are looking for members and councillors and parliamentary candidates all over this country. So if you're interested in that, go to our website, respectparty.org that's www.respectparty.org if you can play a part in changing politics in Britain for the better, we want to hear from you Thank you very thank much you. Uh, George yeah. for all your time uh, George Galloway, uh, George, MP, thank you This thank has been you. the Tony Topping Show on Planet X <laughs>